Good evening, everyone, and I hope you can hear me. And welcome to another class on the week's Torah portion. This week we study the portion of Dvarim. It's the first portion of the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is also called a repeat of the Torah. In Hebrew, we call it Mishnah Torah. And the reason is because everything that happened already once in the first four books are repeated, is repeated in this week, in this book. Um, there are a few uh, unique features to this book, and I just want to mention one so that we can have a little background, and that is the previous four books were given to the generation that lived in the desert. The fifth book, the book of Deuteronomy, is given to the generation that's about to enter the Holy Land. They are not the desert generation. It's a whole new type of people, and they have a, a whole new type of relationship with God. The people who lived in the desert did not hear the book of Deuteronomy. The fifth book does not belong to them. Having said that, I would like to concentrate on a few points in this week's portion. The entire portion, as the subsequent portions, are a subtle rebuke of Moshe on his deathbed just before, 40 days before he passes on, to the Jewish people about their past misbehaving. And he begins by reminding them about different events in which they disbehave, misbehave, and did not obey God. The first major uh, event that he is talking about is in chapter 1. It starts at uh, verse uh, 22, where he reminds the Jewish people of the sin of the spies. The sin of the spies began at the second year of the Jewish people camping in the desert. And as we all know, it was the catalyst for the people living in the desert for 40 years. They were supposed to grant the Holy Land immediately, but instead, because they rejected the, the offer to enter the Holy Land, God punishes them that they will not see the land and they will wander in the desert for 40 years. Later on, he goes on to rebuke them and remind them of other sins. But regarding the story of the spies, in the Chumash, in the book we are using is at page 1128. In any book, you'll find at chapter 1, verse 22, we find many odd comments that Moshe is making. There are plenty more than I will share, but I will share those that are going to be is answered with one answer. The first is, he said, you all came to me, but you all approached me and said, let's send men ahead of us who will search out the land for us and bring us back a report. The first question is, if you read in the original story of the spies, it had nothing to do with the Jewish people. We read, God said to Moshe, Shlach lecha anashim, appoint, appoint a bunch of men to be sent out as spies. Here Moshe suddenly changed it and says that you came close near me and you approached me and asked for spies. Number one. Question number two, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I liked it, that's verse 23. Moshe says, it seemed like a good idea to me, and I sent out 12 men. Number 24, they went to the mountain, and they came, they, they scouted the land. They took some of the fruit. In verse 25, in the, in the middle we read, and they said, the land is very good. And one asked, when did they say the land was very good? They actually said the land is not good. And he continues on, pay, on verse 26 on page 130 or 31, 131 in English, but you did not want to go up. 
he blames the Jewish people, telling them that the spies came back with a good report. Rashi answers that he is referring to the two spies that actually gave good report, namely Joshua and Caleb. But if in the text, if you read, it does not refer, it is no, no reference to Caleb and Joshua. It's to the entire spies. Moshe is say, saying, they came, they told us the land is very good, and you refuse to enter the Holy Land. So here is the third question. The fourth question is, only in three weeks in the portion of Shlach, is going to rebuke the Jewish people about the golden calf. And page, you'll find it if you wanted to, and page 11, um, and page, hmm. later on in chapter 9 and 10, in the portion of Shlach, we read about the scene of the golden calf. Now, anybody who follows the chronological uh, history will know that the golden calf occurred much sooner, a year before the spies. Why did Mudos Moshe prefer to change the order, rebuke them about the spies first and the golden calf much later? And again, to summarize a few questions, as I said, there are many other questions. First is Moshe tells the Jews, you all came to me and asked, let us send spies. And I like the idea, which is if you read in the original, you'll find that it was God who asked Moshe to appoint spies. The second is we read that they came back and said the land is very good, which we know 10 of them said no good. And the third one is you did not want to enter the land. In other words, it was the Jewish people, not the spies. Well, we know the spies were the one who convinced them not to enter. And number four, why is the spies the first rebuke and the golden calf, which happened almost a year earlier, did not take precedent, did not appear as first. There are several answers, and as I said, there are many other questions, but the following is the Rebbe's explanation. The Rebbe says that the original scene, figuratively and in and, and in the, literally, is the inability to accept responsibility. And this is what Moshe wants to teach the Jewish people. And I think it is so powerful, the message, especially in our day and age where I don't want to talk too much politics, but we all know that the, there is a Black Lives Movement and everybody thinks that they should be counted as well. Jewish people respond to such events is actually with saying, we need to learn to assume responsibility. One of the original uh, sin, another one, the first sin that men sinned against God was the eating of the tree of knowledge. If you uh, read in the story of the tree of knowledge, God comes to Adam and says, why did you disobey me? What does Adam do? He blame Eve. He refuses to assume responsibility. God turned to Eve and he says, why did you give it to your husband? And what does she do? She blames the serpent. She took blame off our, our shoulders and finding somebody else. We find in many occasions, I shared on several occasions, the difference between King Saul, the first king appointed by God, versus King David, who was also appointed by God, they both sinned and disobeyed God. How come David's sin was forgiven? King Saul's sin was not forgiven? It is not about the sin itself they committed. It is rather about the refusal to accept responsibility. When David is told by, but told by Nathan, the prophet, that you have committed a major crime and angered God, David immediately burst in tears and he's asking forgiveness, begging for his life. King Saul, when Samuel, the prophet, turned to King Saul and says, why did you disobey God's command? He says, well, the people made me do it. He is shifting the blame on the people 
on the crowd and not on himself. And that's when Samuel says, God had tear off, it ripped off the kingdom from you. You don't deserve to be a king. M Moshe, Moses, when he rebukes the Jewish people, he wants to teach them the first lesson in life, which is, it is okay to disobey. It is okay not to follow orders. It is okay not always to do what's right. It is not okay to look for someone else as a scapegoat. And that's why he begin the rebuke with the story of the spies, telling them, I want you to know, don't tell me that it's the spies' fault. Don't tell me it is God who appointed them, but actually it is your responsibility. And you being able to come clean and say, we are sorry, we have made a mistake, God would have forgiven you. The reason God decided to keep you around is for 40 years and not allow you is not for the sin of the spies coming back with Lashon Ara, with evil, uh, with evil message about the Holy Land. It is not about the people convincing, the, the spies convinc convincing you that God was unable to conquer the land. It is not about any other part of the story in the original text. It is simply about you refusing to enter. It is simply about you refusing to assume responsibility and say it is our job and we are able to do it. And if we said we cannot or God cannot do it, let us ask God forgiveness and then we can move on. God will, God will be willing to change, to turn the page. That's why, by the way, it says you all came to me. It's not about God appointing. That's why God, he says to them that the spies gave a good report because actually there were two who gave a good report. It depends who you, whose uh, opinion you take, whose, uh, whose uh, opinion, whose side you take. And that's why he says you disobeyed God, you refuse, not about the spies. It is all, and that's why it is the first. Because learning to assume responsibility is a sign of maturity. The difference between a child and an adult, they both misbehave, they both fail, they both make the wrong decisions. An adult will be able to look inside and say, I need to take the responsibility, I need to do something better, I need to ask for forgiveness, and then he's able to move on to the next level. That's why the story of the spies is so much different than the original stories, and that's why it appears the first. I want to move on to one more, but you know what? I, for the sake of uh, not missing the following, I want to show with you uh, uh, another point that can be illustrated through a story that I read today. Moses is telling the Jewish people about appointing judges to rule and adjudicate and teach the Jewish people right from wrong. You may find it on page 1128, and Moshe Rabbeinu is appointing different judges and officers for each 10, for each 100, for each 1,000 and 10,000, etc. There were many, many judges because the Jewish people, unfortunately, always like to sue each other and actually will not be satisfied. They will go for an appeal, etc., etc. So therefore, they needed many, many judges. Every 10 Jews had a judge. Every 10 judges had a judge. Every 100 uh, Jews had an, every 1,000 Jews had a judge. There were hierarchy of different level judges, but there were, I think, 20,000 judges to a crowd of 600,000 men. But when he appoints the judges on verse 16, chapter 1, Moshe Rabbeinu says the following, and on that occasion, I instructed you judges saying, listen patiently to your brother's claim, even if you have heard a similar case before, and judge righteously between a man and his brother who disputes him. And there are many, many laws derived. The following is the Hasidic law before we start. Moshe is just on the plain level, Moshe tells the judges, you never hasten a case. You never say to yourself, 
it's only a dime, it's only a dollar, it's not worth my time. You never uh, uh, compare cases without getting into the details because as we know, the devil is in the details. Sometimes a second case can come up a couple of weeks later that sounds and looks like exactly the same as the one before. So you know what the ruling is, yet you have to look back, study the Torah, study the law and make render a ruling as if it is a case that came to you for the first time. But the words, the words are very meticulous and that's the way the Kabbalah teaches us. Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, Shamoa, Shamoa is the word for like Shema, Shema Israel. Hear, Shamoa, listen. Ben Achechem, between your brothers. You must listen between your brothers, which means is you must listen to the disputes that going on between the two men. But the following is, a. Uh, uh, by the way, one more ruling that is derived from here, which is a judge is forbidden from listening to a claimant before, without listening, without the defendant being present. So if someone is filing a lawsuit against someone, a neighbor or a friend or a family member, they must both be present when the uh, accuser is sharing or, point, uh, or bringing up his case. He, the judge is forbidden from listening to one side without having the other side present. That's one interpretation which is part of Jewish law. You must listen between your brothers, meaning among both present. But the following, and, and this rule has uh, many ramifications, you can never render a ruling without listening. So if the defendant has run away, or defendant is not available, unfortunately is not around anymore, the judge by Jewish law cannot render a ruling if it's a dispute between two parties. There was when the Baal Shem Tov was, uh, when the Baal Shem Tov uh, revealed himself as a teacher of Torah, he once in his village, uh, a group of sages arrived as representative of the court of the four countries. I'm just gonna share a very, very brief introduction to it. During the 16, 17 and beginning of the 18th century, there were four or three countries that bound together to create a bed din, a court, that will render major rulings to all communities in those three countries. It was named the court of four countries and they were Poland, Lithuania, and I think Galicia, but it was the vast majority of the Ashkenazic world. Twice a year, the court will, recon will convene with representatives of each community and they will render rulings that will be abiding to all Jewish people living in those countries. So majority of Jewish people or in the Ashkenazic world at the time had to be following the, the court, the court, it's called the court of the four, four countries community. Vaad Arba Aratzot. So a bunch, a, a, a group of sages arrived in Mezhebuz in the town of Baal Shem Tov with a message from the court, that high court, it's like the Supreme Court. And they, when they were directed to the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov invited them in and they turned to Baal Shem Tov and they said, we have a ruling that was issued against you, that you are a Messianic Jew and you teaching are forbidden for, from a Jewish point of view and you should stop or we will excommunicate you. The Baal Shem Tov smiled and he turned to them and he says, can you tell me why they issued that ruling? Based on what? What conduct, what teaching? And they started sharing with them all kinds of rumors they heard about the Baal Shem Tov. He said this, he said that, he's doing this dancing. And he sat down and started proving that they are wrong. And all he does is accord in accordance to Jewish law. As the story goes, they discussed, debated, and argued for two days and two nights. 
and at which the Baal Shem Tov was able to prove them on each and every point they had that he was correct and they were wrong. In addition, they discovered a giant in Torah understanding way, way more than they can fathom. So at the end of the two days and the two nights, they knew that they have to go back to the court and share their experience. So before they left, they asked the Baal Shem Tov if he has something to add to what they are going to share, their experience with the argument, discussing and debating and realizing that he's a holy man. And the Baal Shem Tov said to them, I want to show it, I want you to share with the court two things. The first is, why didn't they summon me to court to allow me to listen to my point of view, to allow me to defend my viewpoint? It is a direct violation of Jewish law. In this expulsion, I command, as Moshe says, I commanded you judges to listen between you brothers. They have some people who had some claims against me, they should have summoned me and I would be gladly to, I would have been very happy to go to court and express my point of view and share with you exactly where I'm coming from. So that's first violation they did. The second is he said to the uh, representatives, tell the court, those rabbis from, four, from three different countries, that there is a new way of studying Torah. Until now, you study Torah through your brains. My way of teaching Torah and connecting to God is through my heart. Through the heart, I pay attention and care about a fellow Jew and not just using the brains. The way these judges render the ruling is from purely their brains, from their mind. They heard certain things and they ask for witnesses to come and testify, and some witnesses testified, and just using their mindset and their intellectual capacity, they were able to come to a ruling, to a conclusion that I was doing wrong. However, had they followed the Jewish law of the same verse that, I'm, that we just studied, they would have realized that in order for you to render the proper ruling, you must function through the heart with the mind. In other words, you have to use your heart to be kind and listen and ask and give a second chance and being able to allow for the person to defend himself and explain himself. And he said to them, this is what the verse says, I commanded you judges, listen between you brothers, between the word between is bane. Bane also comes to the word of lev or, or uh, wisdom. Bina, chokma is intellect. Bina is wisdom. Wisdom comes through the heart to be able to develop the idea. And only when you are among your brothers, you can listen. He said to them, you know, before you render a ruling, don't just look to the intellectual, purely uh, intellect part of Torah or what you hear, but rather make sure that you put your heart into it, trying to understand where the other person is coming from. And in addition, you must listen between your brothers, meaning you have to be among them, socialize with them, see what their needs are, make sure you understand how they live their life that will assist you in making the proper ruling. And that's why he says to the rabbis, where the messengers, when you go back to the rabbis, tell them they erred in this verse by not giving me the benefit of a doubt and summoning me to summon me and ex make me explain my point of view. It was because they were not following the, the dictum of be, listen be, by being among your brothers, socializing, being part of a community, had they done that and made sure they connect to God, not just through their brains, but also through their heart, it would have allowed them to render a different ruling. I want to show one more thing, one more point. And that is, later on, if you read, uh, in verse 
on page 1133, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 37, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people that they were punished with the, with the spies not to enter the Holy Land, except on verse 30, 36, it says, except Caleb, the son of Yefune, he will see it and I will give him the land because he followed God. Verse 37 is very strange. He says, because of you, God has also became angry with me saying, you will not come there to the land either. He says, Moshe Rabbeinu says, you know, the spies, the sin of the spies, disobeying God and not trusting God to be able to conquer the land, prevented you from entering the land, except Caleb. But me too, God who was angry with me, did not allow me to enter the land. All the commentators ask, Moshe Rabbeinu did not sin in the golden calf. He did not accept the, 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 the message that came from the bad spies. Why, was, why do we, Moshe says that he's the, the reason he's not entering is because of the sin of the spies. We know it had to do with the water hitting the rock at the water the fa and not the spies. The following very briefly are different answers uh, and then we'll see the, the final answer. There are four answers. Nachmanides says, no, this is not the reason he was punished. He was punished because of he, he did hit the rock and not speak to the rock. But he wants to be listed with those who are forbidden from entering the land. Until now, uh, we read about the spies and the generation of the desert that are not entering the Holy Land. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, me too, I'm not entering the land. That's Nachmanadi. Orachaim said, Actually, this is the scene that he was not entering the Holy Land because he was part of the scene of the spies. Abar Benel says, I don't understand the Orachaim, that that's the punishment. We know the Torah tells us that he was punished because he hit the rock. Says the Orachaim, his punishment is that he sent the spies. He knew to trust better. He knew that he can trust God and there is no need for spies. The fact that he chose to allow the spies to go to the Holy Land is considered also a sin, but he wasn't rebellious against God in an open way like the rest of them. That's why it, God prevented it from him in openness, but the real reason he did not enter the Holy Land is because of the sin of the spies. The Malbin answers in a very simple way, which is actually Rash, the way Rashi understands. The Malbim says, another commentator, number four, that God is parenthetically adding one extra verse that has nothing to do with the context of the spies. We just read that Caleb is not going to, is not going to be punished and he's going to enter the land. Later on, we read that Joshua will also enter the land because he was also a very righteous man. There is a difference between Caleb and, Re and Joshua. If you read the text, it says that Caleb will, will see it and he will conquer it. Joshua, we read, not only we will see it, but he will also divide it and inherit it. In other words, it seems that Joshua is getting a greater reward than Caleb. That's why Moshe has to explain the difference between Joshua and Caleb explaining that he is not entering the Holy Land for another reason, not mentioned here. And therefore Joshua has to take leadership. That's why he's the one who is going to inherit the land to the Jewish people. And Caleb is not because Joshua was appointed the next king after Moshe. The Rebbe says, the, the, the reason I share with you this is where the, the Lubavitch Rebbe points out that Rashi omitted the whole discussion because Rashi most likely accepted the Malbim that this was interjecting here a side, uh, a side uh, point that had nothing to do with the story of the spies. Rashi was not just teaching Torah. He was a teacher, an educator, trying to raise a child to be able to try and comprehend and find by himself answers. And Rashi was hoping that the student would have read the story a few times until he realizes that the story when he, Moshe says, I am not entering the Holy Land, is not because of the spies, had nothing to do with the story in which it is fell in the middle, but rather it is to explain the difference between Caleb that appeared before 
and Joshua that appears immediately after. And we are running out of time, so I'd like to stop here. I just want to share with you one more thing, which is, uh, if you didn't hear, but it's important news for our community, that the police, together with the detectives, the sheriff, the FBI's, US Marshals, were able to find the perpetrator who painted graffitis on two temples in town, and it, they found out it's the same person who did it before in April on Temple Emmanuel. He's in custody and he's gonna be charged to the full extent of the law. So thank God for good news. Thank God it's only one person and not more. And uh, I only wanna wish everyone to have a good week, uh, healing days in which we always share news, good news from each other and always meet each other on happiness. Thank you, everybody, and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.